pages turn, so I'm old school. So I like to hear the pages turn, so let me hear it, you know, sometimes during this message. Amen. Chapter 2 of Luke. Let's start right here at verse 1. This is really kind of shares the story, but I want to bring it out in a different way today. But uh, I want you to hear what the word of the Lord says. It says, in, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her... She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, watch, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. I want to talk to you today about this. Why do we have Christmas? Why is there a Christmas? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why is there even a Christmas every year that we set forth and, and, and put aside and, and bring up this great glorious thing that the Lord did for us over 2,000 years ago? Why? Why do we do this? Well, you've got to understand something, folks, that next Saturday is Christmas. We have waited almost 365 days for this day. Amen. Some of you have finished your shopping. Some of you have prepared for family to come over. Some of you have went to the grocery store. Some of you have made arrangements for family members that are out of town to come and stay with you, to kind of have a little fellowship together and, and, and some joy of celebrating this great season. Amen. I mean, we've done that. And see, that's when all the families and friends gather together and they exchange gifts and they have good food to eat and they have good fellowship and they spend this valuable time with one another. Sometimes, folks, we're in such a busy world nowadays that the only time people even get together is either at Easter, Thanksgiving, or Christmas. It's sad that we live in that type of society where we're just so busy that we can't slow down for our family anymore. But the world has come to a place to where we have a privilege. We have a privilege as believers. We have a privilege of the world here to celebrate over 2,000 Christmases since that first Christmas was displayed. Amen. And I want you to see something. I've got a question for you today. What if there would never been a Christmas? What if there would never been that first Christmas? Have you ever thought about that? What if there had never been 
uh, 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 Jesus had never come and been born in that stable all those years earlier. Well, I can tell you this, the world that we live in right now may be a little rough and may be a little on the edge right now, but the world would look a whole lot different than it even does now had there never been a Christmas. Amen. See, there would be no New Testament. There would need be no churches because the church was developed in the New Testament. The New Testament church started in the book of Acts, chapter 2. There was no churches prior to that. There would be no New Testament Bible. Everything from Matthew to Revelation would be deleted. There would be no Easter celebration in March or April. There would be no Thanksgiving Day because the pilgrims were Christians and they were looking for a place to share their religious freedom. There would not even be a Mother's Day or a Father's Day. Do you know that? Because it was the Christian church that began that. Have you ever, did you know that? That Father's Day and Mother's Day began in the Christian church? There would be no America that we know it as. Because Christopher Columbus was a Christian. And he was a religious man on a quest to discover new lands for Christ. To bring Christianity. Did you know that? Look at if there would never been a Christmas. Oh Lord. We would still all be under the Old Testament law, the old Levitical law, the old rules, set a rule law. Amen. We would be under the law of Moses. Amen. Have you ever thought about that or even looked into that? Let me just share a few little things. And you may squirm in your seat, but you don't have to today because we're under grace, praise God. We're not under the law. We're not under all of these Old Testament rules. But let me share something with you. In the old Levitical law, the Old Testament, here's what would happen. If you murdered somebody, if you kidnapped somebody, if you committed adultery or rape, if you uh, broke the Sabbath, if you were homosexual, if you had sexual relations outside of marriage, if you were a false prophet, a false witness, a disobedient child, if you cursed your mom or dad, <laughs> oh, Lord, oh, I see the squirming going on now. Or if you uh, were rebellious to your parents, all right, think about it. If you used God's name in vain, if you were someone caught stealing, you were to be stoned to death back in those days. Woo, and that would really appears to be empty today, wouldn't it? Some of us probably have fallen into some of them categories in our life. None of us are perfect by no means. We know that. But thank God they were not under that old law. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we ain't under that Levitical law, that Old Testament law? Praise God. Amen. You see, we would all have to convert to the Jewish faith. We would all still be offering animal sacrifices every week, every month, every year. We would still be required to travel to Jerusalem three times a year. One for Passover, one for Pentecost or the, day, or the Feast of Weeks, and one for the Feast of Tabernacles. And your tithe that you give would not be 10%, it would be 30%. It would be 30%. See, here's how it would be broke down back in these days. 10% of your crops and herbs were God's. 10% tithe to the Levites and 10% tithe to the temple in Jerusalem. Oh, Lord, you and I couldn't have any fellowship with God Almighty as our Heavenly Father. We would not know Him as that. We would have to go through the priest to talk to God. But aren't you glad when Jesus died on the cross that that veil was torn in half? Aren't you glad that now He said, whosoever will, let him come? That we are all priests and we can go into our Heavenly Father and talk to Him one-on-one. -on -one. I ain't got to go to you and you ain't got to go to me. Isn't that good? That's enough to praise the Lord over right there. Amen. You've got to understand something, folks. We would have no concept of what heaven was like. Revelation wouldn't be written. We wouldn't know what was going to be the afterlife of us. We would just live, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. We just live a good life. There's no hope in nothing whatsoever. But now we know that we have a place in heaven. Amen. That is waiting on us. Praise God. Our sins would never be remitted. Our sins would never be atoned. Our sins would never be redeemed. 
We would have to go once a year to that high priest and he have to lay out that sacrifice. And, and if God accepted that sacrifice, it would just cover our sins for a year at a time. It would never take them away. It just push them forward. Push them forward. Amen. Yes, if there would never been a first Christmas, none of us in this room would ever have experienced God's love to its fullest. Think about it. We've sang songs today about the love of God. We've sang songs today about how He came for us. That He loved you so much that He came for you. He could have started all this over. He's God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He has all power in heaven and earth. He didn't have to do what He did. He didn't have to have a redemption plan. He could have said, I'm starting all this over. But He loved you so much that He came to make a way. Amen. You see, we would never be able to experience God's amazing grace. Grace was something that was not even heard of in the Old Testament. It was all a law, a checklist. You do this, you get this. You don't do this, you die. You do this. You know, thank God. How many like rules? Do you like rules? We all have rules sometimes we have to obey by, but thank God they don't qualify in the, in the, in the Word of God. We just need to live right, folks. Live righteous. Do right. When you love God, you want to do right. Yeah, amen? You don't want to sin when you love God. You, when, you, when God's in your life and He's directing you by His Holy Spirit, you don't want to disappoint Him. I know the worst thing I could ever do is, is disappoint my wife or my mother or something like that. But I tell you what, folks, it, it would hurt me even worse to disappoint the Lord, to disappoint Him and do something that would be rebellious against Him that would hurt His feelings. Do you think God's got feelings? He's got feelings, folks. It hurts him when we run astray and we, and we pick other things out in the world that brings our joy instead of him. It hurts him. He's a jealous God. We know that, but yet he loves us. Thank God. So let me ask you this. Aren't you glad Jesus was born? Can I get an amen in the house? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ was born? Aren't you glad that we had that first Christmas way back 2,000 years ago? But Christmas would be meaningless today that we celebrate if it wasn't for four truths that it possesses. Four truths. I want to talk to you about them four truths. Amen. Turn with me to the book of John. Everybody knows this by heart, but John chapter 3, verse 16. Look what it says. Truth number one is this right here. For God so loved the world. Stop. Stop right there. For God so loved the world. Now, we all have great love. For different things in our life. We love our husbands. We love our wives. We love our parents. We love our kids. We love our grandkids. I mean, these are great loves that we have been instilled by, by the Lord himself. Some of us in here may even have certain love for material things. Like houses, cars, money, things like that. That's a different type of love. But it's still considered a form of love. But true, genuine love. True contending love that will never make you hunger again only comes from God himself. It only comes from the Lord alone. Amen. There's no love outside the love of God. I talked to somebody one time that was an atheist and they told me, they said, oh, I don't believe in God. I said, yeah, you do. They said, no, I don't. I said, I can prove you do. They said, prove it. I said, you got any kids? They said, yeah. I said, do you love them? He goes, yeah, I love them. I said, that comes from God. Got any grandkids? Yeah, I, yeah. That don't prove that I, that, that, that I don't believe in God. I said, God's got some of you in Him. Because we cannot experience any type of love outside God giving it. God is the definition of love. He ain't in love. He is love. Any love you have for anything comes from the Lord. It matters if you spit in His face, you hate Him, you curse Him, whatever. He still shows His love to all men. And I thank God for that. I thank God that I wasn't a perfect person by no means or even deserved salvation when He loved me first. The Scripture tells us when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means we had nothing to prove before God that showed Him that why don't you die for me, Lord, I love you. No, we didn't love Him. We had nothing to do with that. He is that true definition of love. And His love is greatest because of this. It's unconditional. We are conditional people. You love me, I'll love you. You hate me, and boy, it's hard to love somebody that hates you, isn't it? But the Lord says, you can't make me not love you. 
Scripture says in Romans 8 that nothing will separate us from the love of God. You hear me? Nothing. But all oh, you just don't understand, Pastor Steve, what I've done. You just don't understand how much I've rebelled against God. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. You can take it to the bank. If you don't get nothing else I say today, remember, God's love is unconditional. I hate it that ours is conditional, but we need to have the love for one another. The scripture says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love him like that. And what else? Love your neighbor as yourself. Do that, folks. Can we love one another the way Christ loved us? When they disappoint us, when they talk about us, when they stab us in the back, when they gossip on us, can we still say, I don't like that, but Lord, I love them. Bless them, Lord. I love them. Can we do that? The Lord said he could. He wants us to be an example like him. God's love is the greatest because it has purposes. What is his purposes? How broad is God's love? How broad is it? Look at Luke, the book of Luke. Chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to those that are blind, and to set liberty to those that are bruised. Man, that covers a whole wide group, don't it? All of us fall into one of those categories. How broad is God's love? It's as broad as the necessities of the world. You don't have a problem too big for God. You don't have a situation too big for God that his love won't reach out and touch it. You may be captive in sin, and he'll set you free. You may be blind to the spirituality of what he wants you to be, and the world has blinded you out there. Hey, he'll give you sight. You may be needing healing in your body, in your spiritual man, whatever. He's the healer. He's everything, and it all comes by love. Love. Jesus never done nothing on this earth that he walked and that he healed and that he ministered to that wasn't driven by love. And that's what we need to do, folks, as Christians. Everything we do for the Lord, when we sing for the Lord, it needs to be out of love for God. When we preach the word, it ought to be out of the love for God. When we greet one another and say, I love you, I'm glad to see you here in the house of the Lord, it ought to be out of the love of God. Everything we do in word and in deed should be in through the word of Jesus and the love of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We don't need to have any other motives but the love of God. So what length will God's love go? All right, let me share that with you. Look at Romans 5, 8. How far will it go? What's the length of it? Amen. 5, 8 of Romans but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I've always liked that because I thought to myself, I was out being a hoodlum and running like a fool and doing all these things out in the world, you know, not thinking about God, only thinking about what I could do and all this, that, and other, that God commended his love toward me that while I was even a sinner out there, that he made a way. He made a way. Christ died for me and paid a debt for me, and all I had to do is accept it. Every one of us in this room, whether you know the Lord or you don't, you got a, a paid in full stamped on you. All you got to do is say, I accept that. I accept that. Your debt is paid in full. All you got to do is say, yeah, I, I'll take that. Some of us uh, have accepted that. Maybe some of us haven't. But you can today because of the love of God. What is the depth of God's love? How deep will God's love go? Look at John 15 now. Go back with me to John 15, 13. Amen. How deep is that? Greater love, Jesus said, hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You know that Jesus calls you a friend? He calls you a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. How many like good friends that you can depend on? Some of us got good friends that we can depend on, that we can share a heart with, we can vent to, we can do all that, and they're always going to be with us. But I'll tell you one thing, you don't have a friend closer than Jesus. He's your friend that will never leave you. You can't make him leave you. You can't make uh, him be disappointed to where he don't want to be your friend no more. Amen. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but Jesus himself was willing to die in our place, even though he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong, but yet he says, I'm not the sinner here, but I'm going to take your sin on, and I'm going to pay your debt. 
Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question. This has always uh, kind of been close to me and everything. And I've said maybe this before, but would, would you want to pay somebody's debt that don't manage their money right and that if you gave them $100 to go get them some groceries, they went out and bought drugs or something with it or something? I mean, it would be hard to kind of support that, wouldn't it? But Jesus says this. He came to this earth and he died in our place, even though he had no debt, we were in the sin debt, but he says, I'm going to pardon every one of you. I'm going to come in and I'm going to wipe it clean. I'm going to sacrifice my own life, even though I didn't do anything wrong, because of your failures. Now that excites me today, because you see, as Carol said earlier, Jesus thought you were so valuable that he wanted to do that for you. You were so valuable to him that he loved you so much. I don't know anywhere in the scripture where it says he knows every hair in an animal. I don't know anywhere in the scriptures where it says that the grains of the sand of the seas is his thoughts toward you. I don't know anywhere in the scripture where it says it's toward anything else but you. He named every star in the universe, galaxy upon galaxy, trillions of stars. He calls them by name, but yet your name is written in the palm of his hand. Think about that. Think about a creator that has so much power. I was looking last night on the internet, and they had a guy that was on it. You might have seen it. I think it happened a few years ago that was at the, the, the brink of space, and he jumped out. Y'all remember that guy that fell from space and he was going to set a world record and everything? He jumped from space and it showed the beauty. And he even said while he was falling, he said, you need to see what I see. You need to see what I see. Man, he got up to almost 800 miles an hour. That's how fast he was falling and everything. And then finally, as the closer he got to earth, it slowed down, slowed down, slowed down. Finally, it got down to about 120 miles an hour. And I was so amazed because... All of that creation, it showed the earth from his view. He said, you need to see what I see. He was like, I think, 24 miles above the earth. I think is what it said. 24 miles. And that's just the handiwork. That's the handiwork, folks. When we see the beautiful skies painted view, when we see the, the, the Grand Canyon and the beauty of it, when we see the marvelous things on this earth or even up in space, all those things that we go, oh, he says, oh, that ain't nothing. That's just my handiwork. You're the one that I'm on about. You're the one I'm on about. And that's why it hurts Christ so much when we say, I don't want you. I don't want no part of you. I, 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 I appreciate it, but let me live my own life. It hurts him because he says, Oh, man, I love you so much. I want you with me. I'm showing you the depth that, that, that greater love has no man than this, that a man would come and lay down his life for his friends. All right. He paid that sin debt for the whole world that you and I can live through him. So the first truth is this. Why do we have Christmas? Why is there a Christmas? Why do we celebrate a Christmas? Because God so loved the world. The second part, the second truth is that he gave his only begotten son. Truth number two. Amen. Why we have Christmas? Because he gave his only begotten son. Many gifts are given for different reasons. We know that. Many of you, the reason you give gifts to your family and friends and grandchildren and all that at Christmas time is a representation of the gift that Christ gave for us. It just shows the love you have for them. That's why Christmas is represented around presents. But don't make it all about presents. Don't make it all about the materialistic things of Christmas. And, and, and society has done that. Tell me any mall you can walk in and you say, and you see Jesus is birthday. Happy birthday, Jesus. You ever see that? No, you see Santa Claus and you see this, that, and other. It's materialized. It's all been kind of sacrificed in a sense. But the real reason, folks, is what he did for us 2,000 years ago. I remember when I first became a Christian, it brought tears to my eyes. Jewel and I, I said, we're going to have a birthday party for Jesus. It's his birthday, isn't it? We're going to have a birthday party for Jesus. I went to the mall. I went to this place that's so big, helium balloons and stuff. I looked around at all the balloons. They had Santa Claus, they had reindeer, they had Rudolph, they had... Frosty, they had all this. And I went to the man 
preacher and I said, hey, excuse me, I said, I'm looking to have a birthday party for Jesus. Do you have any happy birthday Jesus uh, balloons? And then they looked at me like I was from another planet. They go, no, that's all we got. And it brought tears to my eyes. And the reason it did, because the reason that we celebrate Christmas today is because of him. But yet Jesus is left out. He's left out. And I like what Brother Josh said. How many of you on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day will think about Jesus? How many of you will think about the materialistic things of what gift you get? Oh, I didn't want that. Why would you give me that? How about just thinking if you never get a materialistic gift, whatever, that you got the ultimate gift, and that was Christ himself. You ever thought about that? Amen. So I look at that, and gifts are given for different reasons, and gifts can vary from material things to gifts of love and respect. I'll tell you what, folks, you might not have a dollar to your name, but if you show friendliness and love to somebody, you, you, you've given the best gift you can. It ain't about the money. It ain't about the shiny jewelry. It's about respect. It's about love. I'd rather have somebody love me and respect me than give me all the money in the world because you can't buy that. It's got to come from the heart. Amen. There was a soldier one time back in the army. He lost his right hand. He got shot off during combat. And people used to ask him. He didn't have no prosthetic hand or nothing. It was just a nub there. And people used to ask him, Hey, how'd you lose your hand? And he would always reply this, I didn't lose it, I gave it. And they said, you gave it? He said, yes, you see, I've given it for the love of my country. So people could be set free and live in freedom. When you think about that, you see his right hand was the gift. And there's many men and women that are not able to be celebrating Christmas with us because they have given the ultimate price for our country so you and I can live in freedom and celebrate this great time of the year. And we, don't, we need to respect that because, folks, just like Dr. Wayne said last week, he was raised up in a place to where they told you everything, they dictated everything, they put you in camps, they kept you out of school, they just controlled you like a puppet. And we need to be thankful for those that have given the ultimate price. See, God has given us the greatest gifts. What are those gifts? The first greatest gift is the cross. Folks, don't underestimate the cross. Don't ever underestimate what the cross represents. Each time we see that cross there, we should be reminded of what Jesus did for us. We should be reminded there because the Bible says in Romans 6 and 23, it says this right here, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus died for us, not because we were good, not because we deserved it, not because he felt sorry for us, but Jesus died for you and I because of one reason. We needed a Savior. We needed a Savior. He loved us that much. We could not save ourselves. The animal sacrifice would not do it. It had to be a pure, effectual blood that only came from the throne of God that was unspotted from sin, and the only one that qualifies for that is Jesus himself. But, but, but I didn't do nothing much wrong. Hey, folks, we were all born in a sinful nature. We were all born in a sinful nature. You may live your life the best you can, and great, praise God, do that. But you still need a Savior. We still need a Savior. And the cross represents that. Amen. Our sinful nature, our fallen state had separated us from God. But you know why? Because God can't look on sin. Even though He loves you, He can't have fellowship with sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, He didn't let them stay in the garden. He loved them. He could have put them to death. He loved them, but He separated them from His presence right there. And He said, the only way you can ever come back into fellowship with me, because I'm a holy God, and now you are fallen mankind, is I'm going to have to build a bridge for you to get back. And the only one that can build that bridge and provide that way is Jesus Christ. Think about it. It's a simple plan of salvation. We make it hard sometimes. Amen. If we were ever to be reconciled back to God, it would only come from a pure sinless sacrifice. And Jesus, <laughs> amen, was that sacrifice. You see, the cross shows 
God's love for lost mankind. The next thing is the greatest gift that God has given us is this. This right here, folks, this word. This word. God breathed through holy men as they were inspired by the Holy Ghost to write those words. A lot of people say, oh, I don't believe the Bible is written by man. But the Bible says, yes, it was written by a man that was inspired by the Holy Ghost to write that. That's God breathed. How many of you, when you first, now I don't know about the young people now because you got smartphones and stuff, y'all text each other. But when I was growing up, when me and Jewel first started dating, I used to send her love letters. Are y'all, am I the only one who did that? Love letters. I'd drop her off a love letter, and she'd drop me off one. Sometimes I'd be bowling in a bowling group somewhere with some friends of mine, and I'd come out after bowling, and on the windshield wiper was a love letter from her. <laughs> Amen. But see, the reason I brought that up is this. This is God's love letter to you. It's a love letter. Look how big it is. It's got 66 books, and especially 39 there. Amen. 27 in the new. Uh, 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 it's a love letter showing how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, what he'd do for you. It's a love letter from God Almighty. It reveals his mind. It reveals his will. It reveals his plan to all of you in your life. Everything is fulfilled right here. Over 7,000 promises of a God's love letter to you. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says it just like this. All Scripture, or you could kind of translate that if you want to put a little caption on the side. All of God's love letter. All of Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He has given us a road map. A love letter of how he loves us and how he wants us to love him. And all we've got to do is say, yes, oh man, I'm moved by your love letter, God. I want to do my best. You know, Brother Larry Tate, the one we was praying for earlier, he writes a letter to God every night. Do you know that? He's been doing it since like 1995 or something. He's got manuals and manuals and manuals of letters. He writes a love letter to God every night. He, you know, where you might pray every night, he writes his in paper. He pray, he writes his prayer every night. Well, I can't wait for the people to see that one day. It's a love letter back to God every night. That's amazing right there. I think that's just super amazing. You see, when we realize the importance of this word right here, this holy Bible, this love letter from God Almighty, our whole life will change. When you pick this up and not look at it as just a book or, oh, I don't have time, but thinking, God's writing me a love letter. Let me look and see what he says to me today. Man, it'll change your whole life. So first we see that we have the cross. Then we see we've got the the word. And then, folks, we've got the church. That's another gift. Not this building. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. See, the church is more than just a building. It's the body of Christ upon this earth. To be his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears, his mouth. We are a representation of the Lord God Almighty on this earth. He loves you so much that he says, I'm going to put that into your authority, into you. I'm going to let you represent me. So, folks, how are we representing him? When we go out into the world and somebody cuts us off in the interstate and we feel the heat and the road rage is starting to circulate in our mind, are we representing Him? Are we representing the Lord in our actions, at our workplace, around our family? Are we representing the Lord uh, in our hands, in our feet, in our mouth, in our ears, in our eyes? Are we watching things that the Lord would watch? Are we watching things that the Lord would turn His head from? Think about it. You see, the church is the body of Christ. And this is why we as the church and the body of Christ need to love one another. We need to walk in unity, the scripture says. Amen. We need to walk in unity. We need to love one another. And we need to be Christ-like examples. And I'll tell you something else we need to all do. We need to encourage one another. We need to edify. One scripture says edify one another more than yourself. Get off the throne, folks. 
Put him on the throne and put your neighbor higher than you. If you can do that, if you can walk up and say, Sister Carol, man, I bless you, man. You've got such a God-given talent. And we can humble ourselves and lift up others more. Christ says, that's exactly what I want right there. That's exactly what I want. Folks, because the Lord told me a long time ago, it ain't about me. I always thought one time back growing up and everything, that oh, Lord, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? And, and I was in church getting discouraged about different things back here. Thing. And the Lord spoke to me one time at an altar way up there in Murfreesboro when we lived there. He said, you know what? It ain't about you. Now, sometimes God gives correction. And, but it was a correction done out of love. And I said, man, you're right, Lord. He said, why don't you start giving me the place in your life that I deserve, and then I'll take care of you. And boy, when I'd done that, then all the doors started opening. Boom, boom, boom. They just started opening. But a door will slam in front of your face, and you won't be able to push it down if, unless you get off the throne. I'm telling you. We are the church. That's a gift from God. We are to love one another. The cross, the word, and the church are God's greatest gift to mankind. Why do we have Christmas? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Because he gave his only begotten son. Truth number three, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. We're breaking it down, but these are the four truths that we need to realize of why we celebrate Christmas. Faith is the lifeline into your Christian walk. It is impossible to please God without faith. Everybody in this room has got faith in something. I've had unbelievers tell me, I don't have no faith in God. I don't even have faith, they said. I said, yeah, you do. They said, no, I don't. I said, yeah, you do. I'll prove it. I said, when you go out there to start your car, now this is back before the push button. This is when you had a key. I said, when you go back there to put that key in, do you say, oh, God, please start? Or do you just automatically take it for granted it's going to start? They say, well, yeah, I guess I do. I just put the key in. I said, you got faith. That's faith that that thing will start. You ain't worried about it, are you? They say, no. And I said, we've all got a measure of faith. The Scripture says God has given every man a measure of faith. Have you ever heard the old saying, I'll have to see it to believe it? I've had that saying. I've heard it growing up. Bible says that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's things that you put your trust in, even though you don't physically see it, you believe it. That's why we're praying for a miracle for Brother Larry. We have not seen it, we've heard the other report, but we're believing by faith that a miracle will perform. We haven't seen it yet, but we're trusting God that it will come to pass. It is the substance of of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please him. He that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Folks, we've got to have that kind of belief system. When we believe by faith, we believe he is who he says he is. He'll do what he says he will do. Think about it. And he, we can receive the promise he said we can receive. That's what faith all in a nutshell is. Faith is a gift from God. And each of us in this room got some type of faith in something. Amen. But when you put it in God, you'll see your life change. You see, we are guilty of making faith hard. We, we, we want to evaluate everything. We're built kind of like, well, it's hard to trust in, it's hard to trust in Jesus when I haven't physically seen him. Let me tell you something. Your eyes are not open. And you say, what? You should see Jesus through other believers. Christ should be resonating out of you. You shouldn't have to wait for Jesus to come in a physical form to say, oh, now I believe. You ought to be able to see it radiate off of each and every one of you if you're a child of God. That's how we people see Jesus. You ever been around people? Have you ever been around people that you walk up and start talking to them and say, man, I feel a presence of God around them. You ever been like that? That is how you see the Lord. And that's how we're going to see him on this face of this earth until he comes and gets us. And then the scripture says when he comes and redeems us, buys us back, and takes us home, then we'll, we'll see him as he is and we'll be like him. Isn't that good? Because folks, listen to me. Even though you're saved, even though your name's in the Lamb's book of life, even though you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and you've got Him living in you, if Jesus Christ should walk in His fullness right here, it'd kill every one of you. 
the holiness would kill every one of you. We have got to be changed into that glorified state when he comes to be able to stand in his presence. That's how holy he is. And then we will because the scripture says when he comes, we'll be changed at the twinkling of an eye. And then, boy, when you look at him, boy, you're going to see the fullness of love displayed. No more bad thoughts. No more sick. No more the defeat, discouragement, depression. All that's gone, folk. When you see the Lord, you ain't going to have no more tears. You ain't going to have no more sadness. You ain't going to, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. The book of Revelations tells us it's going to be so good beyond your imagination. Why wouldn't you want to go to a place like that? Why wouldn't you want to trust that? Amen. All because of the first Christmas. He's made a way for you. Amen. We're going on a trip one day. Folks, you've got to understand something. We are in the dressing room right now. You ever see a bride before she goes out to meet her groom and get married? She's in that dressing room and those those makeup artists and those hair people and, and those uh, a bridesmaid, they're all around and they're getting everything just perfect. Turn around. Let me see that. Oh, yeah. Oh, make sure that's straight. Yeah. I mean, they're getting everything right. And, folks, that's what we're doing. We're making ourselves ready because we are the bride of Christ. And one day he's going to come through that eastern sky and he says, I've come to get my church. I've come to get my bride. That bridegroom's going to come. And, folks, when we're ready and we're ready to see him and we're waiting on him and we're looking unto him, boy, it's going to be a glorious day. You ain't seen a wedding until you get to that one one day. Amen. That's why we need to love one another as the body because we're all part of that. We're all part of that. You don't wear a wedding dress out on your wedding day with one shoe missing. You don't wear, uh, get prepared for a wedding as a bride with, with, with one uh, eyelash gone. I'm just using some examples that we are complete in him. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So we need to be uh, uh, prepared for him. When we make, we make faith so hard sometimes, we want it to fit our understanding and, and, and not just receiving what God has already provided and promised in his word. You've got to understand something. God's grace provides. Here you go. Our faith grabs on to, and the result is salvation. Simple. It's like the old guy out there of the lifeguard. Preacher said this one time. I've always used it because it really ministered to me. Lifeguard sitting on the beach. Help, help. Somebody's out in the ocean drowning. He says, here, grab this life preserver. That's grace. Now that drowning person grabs on to it. That's faith. And he pulls him in. That's salvation. He saved him. Same thing. Grace provides. Faith grabs on to, and the result is salvation. Amen. You see, it is us by faith that repent of our sin. We do that by faith. By faith. I'm a sinner, Lord. I need you in my life. Thank you for dying for me. I, I accept your plan of salvation. I get water baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I bury that old man. I bury that old man. I come out in newness of life. God fills me with the Holy Ghost, and the end result is salvation. Salvation. Never to be plucked out of his hand. Always to be written in the Lamb's book of life. One day when we stand before the Lord, he's going to open up the book, the Bible says, and, and he's going to make a roll call. Aren't you glad if your name is on the roll? You've got to understand something. Every one of us in this room, whether you know the Lord as Savior or not, you're all going to live eternally. I used to think back when I was in sin, the devil had me convinced that, boy, when I die, I ain't going to know it anyway. That's the biggest lie he ever told me. Everybody in this room will live eternally in one of two places, either in heaven with the Lord in glory or in hell with the unbeliever, false prophet, all those things. Folks, I, I beg you, if you don't know the Lord, make sure your name's in the Lamb Book of Life. You do not want to go to the other place. I'm telling you. So why Christmas? Well, for God so loved the world. Why Christmas? Why do we have it? That he gave his only begotten son. Why Christmas? That whosoever believeth in him by faith shall not perish in the final thing, but have everlasting life. That's the greatest icing on the cake right there. That's the greatest part about Christmas is that we have everlasting life. 
How many of you enjoy life? Do you enjoy life? We all should enjoy our life. We really should. We should enjoy life. God's given us the gift of life. How many would like to live forever and ever? Well, we're going to do that too. I've just said it. But God wants us to live a life not only in eternity, but right now. He wants us to live a life right now that's worth living. So many people are looking forward to heaven so much that they quit living here. That's why I, I, I keep bringing Brother Larry up, and I really appreciate him because he's, he knows he's going to one day, but he says, I'm going to live life to its fullest right now. And then when that day comes, then I'll live it fully there. And that's what we should be doing right now, folks. Everybody in this room should live life to its fullest in the Lord because that's what he's designed for you to do. Amen. Amen. First John, we're about finished. First John right here, 5. 11 and 12. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. This eternal life is in His Son. He that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God. That you may know I like that. Not only believe, but when you believe, you'll know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He wants us to enjoy life, and in Him we have that life. Amen. See, God has given every one of us the greatest life, and that's everlasting, eternal life. Amen. Christmas, I think, is the greatest time of the year because of what took place on the first Christmas. The first Christmas. Why do we have Christmas, Pastor Steve? Because of what took place on the first Christmas. That's why we have it. 2021 or so Christmases have went by. Amen. And we're still celebrating the light of the world. We're still celebrating that greatest gift. We're still celebrating that love of God. We're still celebrating that faith that we have in Him. We're still celebrating that everlasting life. Amen. I'll end with this right here. There was a, a classroom, a teacher, it was Christmas time, and the teacher said, kids, I want you to write a letter to Jesus or bring a gift to Jesus. It's his birthday. How many know it's his birthday? And some of the class looked at each other like, what, really? And some of the little classmates, I think they're about third grade, they looked at each other and they said, what do we give Jesus? I mean, he's got everything. What do we give him? And one little girl over in the corner, she said, Oh, I know what we can do. We can go to the mall or we can go to Walmart. We'll buy something real good there. And another student said, No, we can't do that. Man, he's got all that stuff anyway. What can we give him? And some of them said, Well, I don't know. We can throw him a party. They said, Yeah, we can. But what can we give him that would really be what he wanted? And one little old girl over in the corner, she was staring out the window. And she turned to the, to the class and she said, I know what I can give him that he don't have. And they said, what? What? Why tell us? I can give him myself. I can give him myself. And the teacher said, you know, that is the greatest gift that Christ would want. is us giving him ourself. Let's stand. Come on up here, worship team. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior... How about giving him the best birthday present you can ever give him? And that is yourself today. It's not the gold.